Welcome everyone to Future Leadership. And as you know, Future Leadership is a community of change makers, people who are being the change that we want to see in this world. And today with us, we have Timothy Morris. And he's an American who moved to South Africa 10 years ago. And like myself, I think there's something about this country that we never leave. <laughs> and um, <laughs> So he's an author of four brand leadership books and a podcaster. I've shared the link um, on the message on the video below the uh, video. And he's also a consultant on the science of image, persuasion, brand influence, behavioral design, and leadership behavior. He studied applied neuroscience at MIT, and which is a relatively new and very fascinating topic. So Timothy, let's please tell us how, what got you interested in the topic? Hi Radhika. Um, Hi. Firstly, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. I know how much your heart beats for change. It really means a lot to have someone who's so sincere. It's not just another exercise. It's not just another webinar. This is actually a meaningful conversation. So growing up in an area, I think it was my family that inspired me to be interested in in the idea of change, you know, growing up in a community, I grew up in North Carolina on a farm and growing up in an area where you saw that anyone who was genuinely interested in change, the world, you know, growing up in the 70s, 80s, you know, particularly being a black American, you saw that people who were interested in change were able to affect change. There was just a lot of change happening coming out of the civil rights movement. We just you saw change everywhere. You saw people pouring into universities. You saw brands being able to sort of drive change by thrusting influencers. Back then it was just called ambassadors or sponsors, people who were able to sort of represent brands and sell their message of hope and change. So there was this idea that influential people at the sort of cusp of society and their community, people who were influential in their spaces and influential CEOs and influential entertainers were able to champion causes and drive mm. a lot of change. And mm. it was so wonderful to be a part of, to see that. And coming from a family where I have an uncle that's, you know, a pastor, I've got an uncle that's a federal judge, I've got an uncle that spent a lot of time doing the arts who ended up in prison. I just come from this very diverse family that made me think about a lot of things. And, um, and so that's why I became interested in change. And I also saw that if I make a few changes to myself, mm -hmm. then it impacted how people treated me. And that was always interesting as well. And uh, so I feel really grateful that I had all these various sort of inputs and exposures. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I've seen that the people who got the furthest in life were the people who changed themselves first. Mm. The people who went through some sort of level of experience and experienced some sort of aggressive stimuli, which whether it was trauma or whatever, but the people who worked the hardest on themselves were able to experience the rich luxury of change. And so, you know, studying over the years and being drawn to both the social sciences, like neuroscience, behavioral science, and seeing the opportunities of small tweaks small mm. reframing, small adjustments, um, and how profound a small shift can make. That, may, that really inspired me to be really intrigued to marry that with, you know, the, the brand sciences, such as, you know, branding, marketing, and so forth. And so that's just, that's a little snapshot of who I am and why I'm interested in, in this space. So I really liked what you said about it's very, very critical that first before even wanting to see change outwardly, we got to change ourselves, and there needs to be yeah. a certain level of transformation happening. Like, what do we need to know in terms of the change, the mm. inner change, and how do we sure. take it forward? There's a concept called immunity, immunity to change. Okay. And so the first, I think this is the first kind of lesson I want to share today is the what is the immunity to change? So I, to identify that, let's say you want to change from being a person who spends your whole afternoon on the couch to a person who wants to pursue getting healthy and running marathons, okay? Mm. 
Okay, the, yeah. the big challenge and the reason why most people don't change is they don't understand what is the thing that they are enjoying that's keeping them for change. So we okay. often go, we often try to map people into a direction of change without sitting down and spending time with what is the thing that you're enjoying that's mm -hmm. keeping you from change. So for example, if you want to run a marathon, there's a good chance you've underestimated how much you enjoy spending time on the couch, how much you enjoy what you're getting from the couch, the enriching entertainment you're getting from the couch. And by underestimating that, mm -hmm. you create a massive sort of wall and barrier between you and this new direction you want to go. You know, I'm constantly pursuing new areas of study. And if I want to change my mindset, for example, I've got to go, what am I enjoying that's keeping me from this change? And I think that's the same thing when we look at society. If you want people to change their behavior on social media and not be so you know, wildly emotional or whatever, then you got to go, what are they enjoying about being wildly emotional? They enjoy the significance of being noticed. And if you don't replace that significance of being noticed with something that's greater, that has a much deeper emotional benefit, they're not going to change. It's that simple. And I would ask anyone watching to make a note quickly. Okay, what is the area I want to change in? And what is the thing that I'm enjoying that would keep me from changing? That's the first thing. Let's say, for example, you have a cafe. And in your cafe, you are trying to promote organic coffee because you want to change a particular community's success and outcomes. But that particular community, that coffee that you're trying to sell is a little bit more expensive. Then what are people enjoying about this other coffee that they're buying? And what is the story around mm -hmm. it? What is the emotional benefit they're getting? So that's very important. So the immunity to change philosophy and construct is by these, I think it's by these Harvard professors. What they've identified is that the luxury and the joy of the thing you're already doing is what creates the immunity to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone seeking change really underestimates that dynamic. And that's the first thing for me. Every single time I set out on a new direction, first thing I look at is what am I going to be given up that mm -hmm. I really enjoy? And what yeah. weight does it have in my life? And what gravity and having an honest conversation, even to be able to reconcile. Are there other things? Because you said, okay, immunity to change and other things that might be obstructing. See, Or if you also could give us some examples of people that's actually overcome the immunity to change, recognize what they enjoy and made the transition to change. Let's use Apple. Mm. When Apple introduced the iPhone, how did they get people to change the idea that the keyboard on Blackberry, yeah. people enjoy being able to feel the keyboard. To be able to, to like know where your keys are on the phone, the Blackberry was a luxury that people were enjoying. Mm. So how did Apple get people to override the logic of being able to engage the keyboard. How they did it was mm -hmm. quite, quite simple. It was appealing to the emotional need to feel sexy, to, it's almost counterintuitive, appealing to their need to feel sexier, to feel like they're part of a tribe of people who are advanced was how they were able to override people's need mm -hmm. for feeling the keyboard. And this is important because what Jobs understood is that people have this sort of intuitive sense that they want to feel like they're part of an innovative tribe. They want to feel like they're part of the ability to feel sexy, to be able to feel like I'm holding something that makes me not so clunky, that makes me not so stiff. This is what's interesting. When the iPhone was in introduced, people gave up a lot. People gave up the fact that some of these old Nokia phones would stay charged for like two days. Mm -hmm. And an iPhone, you couldn't even last the entire day. So on paper, it made absolutely no sense for people to change. But by appealing to people's deeper subconscious needs, and mm -hmm. I, was, I would always ask people to go, if I'm trying to change a particular market, if I'm trying to change a particular demographic, you've got to ask yourself, what is their mind state? Because what you're doing is marketing to a specific mind state. So the first thing I'd say in this conversation is, 
What is the immunity to change? The second is what is the mind state that I'm trying to market to? And mm. Apple knew who they were marketing to and they were aware that their mind state was to appear elite, a very optimistic kind of elite kind of mind state. And so by giving them a device and a particular tool that made them feel like they were a community of kind of leaders and innovators that were sexy, then people were able, people overrode the immunity to change, which was around the dynamic of having a keyboard that they could relate to, that they were familiar with, that they were already connected to. I mean, people came mm. up a lot. I can't stress this enough. If you don't think people will change, people will change if you, what you give them helps them override the very, that's so beneficial that it helps them override the thing that they were enjoying before. On a personal level, Nelson Mandela is a great example. Nelson Mandela went on Oprah after he came out of prison. Yeah. And he says that I had to change my anger with white people. People don't realize, people think he came out of prison smiling and happy. <laughs> he says, I had, to, I had to change how I felt about all of the atrocities that they had imposed, apartheid regime had imposed on our people and myself by dominating my emotions. And he says to do that, what he acknowledged is that he saw the country literally being lit up in flames. He would visualize that. He would visualize the atrocity. And then he would also think about the absolute joy and the unity and the, the power of a united country. And he would envisage that. And that would help him override his emotional anger. So his change came through seeing a more clear picture of the country mm -hmm. that he wanted, which was a better, more com compelling image in his mind than the emotional anger and the potential mm -hmm. of him going out, sharing his anger and how that could create chaos in the society. So as a leader, he's a perfect example. And I think Apple is a good example of a brand that was able to drive people's, a shift in people's behavior. I mean, you got to always think to yourself, what is the new narrative that I desire? If you're going for change, what is the current narrative or what I call the current formula? What is the existing formula in the community of people I'm trying to change? Um, and what is the desired narrative or formula? And when I say formula, let me, let me unpack that a bit. Daniel Kahneman wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is basically the backbone of what behavioral science is built on. And all behavioral science is understanding what are the psychological and environmental dynamics that lead people to decision making. What's really, really important is that you say to yourself, you go, what's happening in the minds of the people? And what are the environmental shifts that I can change to get new behaviors out of people? So all this is sort of built on the work of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, who were colleagues who kind of built this kind of behavioral psychology merit with economics. They put that on their back. Kahneman um, took this idea in economics, applied it to psychology called system one and system two. This is very helpful for anyone who's trying to drive change. System one is the fast automated side of the brain. It's the side of the brain that is, cre is created so that you don't have to spend energy. So if I say to you, was five plus five, you don't have to spend any energy on it. In fact, it just pops up. So you've created mm -hmm. these formulas and patterns so that you can preserve energy. If we did not have system one, and this is a very important dynamic. I'll use this glass of water. This is water, by the way. Every morning you wake up with a full glass of cognitive energy or load, cognitive load. And system one enables you to keep this load and not use it, okay? okay. So if every yeah. single time I saw five plus five, I had to spend energy, that would be problematic. If every single time I saw a toothbrush, I had to sit there and go, hmm, I wonder what I should do with this. That would mm. be problematic to how the brain works. Radhika, if I say to you what 17 times 33, you've got to pour out energy, okay? That's system two. System two is where you have to put in work. System two is where you have to apply energy to get to a specific goal or an outcome. Mm. Every time you, let's say you have a partner you love to death, 
Imagine every single morning you, you greet your partner and you say, hi, Radhika. You're like, no, my name is not Radhika today. I've changed it. That would require too much energy to figure you out. In fact, if you're listening to this and you have a partner who is very shady, they don't, re they don't pick up your phone when you phone them, you're, that person is forcing you to go to system two. And you go, why are they not picking up my call? Where is this person? So mm. we would prefer to stay in system one where I don't have to use my energy. Mm. So the reason why change is so hard is because no one wants to go to system two. We want to stay in system one. The reason why social media is so interesting because it makes going to system two quite easy. It's like, I can, oh. I can click on this thing and it doesn't require much effort. It's like activism. Historically, you've got to package things up. You've got to get on the street. You're going to be seen. There was just so much required. Now, you can kind of just sit behind your computer and you can just send out stuff and you don't really apply much energy. Now, this is very important. If you're looking to change, you've got to ask people, you've got to ask yourself, what is the existing formula that people are enjoying that if you try to change it to get them to go to system two, mm -hmm then what is this new system two formula? Because people don't mind going to system two under one condition. People will go to system two under the condition that it triggers their values, that it, mm. that it links to something that they are interested in. So it's not that people don't want to change. And mm. it's not that there are, there are obstacles. It's mm. not that the conditions are not right. It's just that most people who are trying to seek change haven't sought the formulas that they're dealing with. And so because people haven't analyzed what the highest values of people are and understand how the brain works, mm -hmm. people are resisting change. And people think, oh no, they're stubborn. No one is stubborn in their highest values. People uh, will go to the ends of the, people will go to <clears throat> the ends of the earth to overcome, people overcome their stuff. They will come, overcome anything if you just take the time to tap into their higher values. The last thing I'd like to share with you is a concept yeah. around using priming and triggers. Okay. So now I'm going to get a little technical real quick before we wrap up. Okay. So I want to think about the power of algorithms and how algorithms derive change. There's a guy named BJ Fogg who wrote the book Tiny Habits, who has a behavioral science lab at Stanford University. So I want people to Google B.J. Fogg because B.J. Fogg has a model and it's a simple idea that you have to really keep the narrative and the messaging super simple and you have to put prompts and triggers in place. So I'm going to unpack this mm -hmm. and make it quite simple, but let me just explain how and why Netflix is super simple. Let's look at what Netflix replaced. Let's think about the DVD store and let's think about Netflix. And let's think about the powerful bonding effect of algorithms over the previous model of walking into a DVD shop. The old DVD shop tried to put in a specific category horror or uh, whatever. What they did not do is make recommendations based on your previous purchase history. The older person that was working in the DVD shop DVD shop would get to know you a little bit and maybe make recommendations, but still they weren't going far mm. enough. If you think about the genius of algorithms is they create, they align to your highest values. They've observed your patterns or formulas. They've observed mm. your patterns and formulas, and then they predict based on these patterns and formulas. The challenge with that is, is that it creates this sort of limited echo chamber. So if you want to change, so I always give the example, if I, click, if I click on Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle as comedians to watch their shows, Netflix assumes that I on, I'm only interested in black, black comedians. comedians. <laughs> yeah. And it won't, me, yeah. Yeah, it won't show me Bill Burr or Seinfeld at all. And so what I do is I hack the algorithm. Oh. And okay. what I do is I will often, even if it's just a random white comedian, I will click on it and watch maybe a minute and then click mm. off just okay. to hack the algorithm. 
And when you're going about change, the first thing is that algorithms can, um, if you're designing an app or a technology where you want to engage people, you can look at people's formulas and design an algorithms around the current behaviors and so forth mm -hmm. to get their attention. But mm -hmm. if you want people to change from an existing algorithm, you've got to present to them external stimuli that's similar to what they are already watching, but provide yeah, some but... sort of delightful difference. If you want to get people who are stuck in an existing algorithm, let's mm -hmm. say they are part of a particular community of left wing type people, uh, or they're radical on some level, look at what their kind of proverbial algorithm is. Look at their patterns, look at their formulas and go, I want to introduce some sort of stimuli that's similar, but offers a delightful difference. Now, let me give you an ex a practical example. When the automobile was created, the, the, the previous formula was me plus a horse equals I get a chance to me plus a horse equals transportation okay now how do I introduce the automobile when people felt safe with the horse and this is my last point mm, yeah initially the resistance to change was this thing is loud and clunky and I don't know if I can trust it what I know is that the horse looks healthy I can be comfortable knowing that this horse will get me from A to B. But this loud mechanical thing, I don't trust it. So what did they do? Using BJ Fogg's sort of principles of, of design and behavioral science, they took this clunky machine, this automobile, and they put the head of a horse on the front of it. And that's why we get these oh, logos okay. on the front of vehicles, oh, is that it was a simple way it was a very super simple way to trigger the unconscious mind to have a relationship with this new thing. And so if you want to drive change, you got to show people a little bit of familiarity with their existing algorithm, mm -hmm. but provide them an alternative delight, which is getting to your destination faster. So that's called priming. That's priming and triggering people on the unconscious level. Here's a good example. You have a young child that you want to do better in math. How do you get them interested in math? Mm. Let's say they love gaming. Their current sort of mental kind of algorithm is, I spend my afternoons playing games. If you can show this child how math forms the, and the science of math is what's driving the games, and if they get better at math, they'll be better at games, mm. then it triggers their mind to see gaming and math in the same frame. Mm. So it, this, forget about the technology sound of algorithm. We are all driven by kind of social algorithms. How we approach people, how we think about our communities, all of it is based on some sort of algorithm, which is a set of patterns that trigger our emotions and our value system. Well, great. Thank you so much, Timothy. Uh, you were talking, we started off um, with number one, which was immunity to change. And then we yeah. discussed on the importance of having a mind state that we are appealing to. And then you spoke on... I w sorry, let me just say that marketing yeah. to a mind state. What is the mind state of the people you want to change? Yeah. Being okay. clear about yeah. what's in their mind state. Yeah, it's it, similar it to help. understanding the system yeah. two, right? Yeah, system one and system two. Understanding that system one and system two, yeah. You were saying it would help? Yeah, no, I was saying it was going to, I was going to say it would, it would help to understand your own mind state. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, first to begin with. Yes. And yeah, then, yeah. yeah, talking with system one and system two, the formulas and patterns and the AP, yeah. aligning it with, to drive the change, aligning, aligning it with one's highest values. And then we obviously spoke on the last primaries. And triggers. Yeah, and I, yeah, I would say that that before priming and triggers to think about breaking the formula. Like breaking. change is breaking the formula. I'd like for people to mm, think about like that, word. that. I would like for people to think about that as a social technology. What change is, is breaking the formula. It's basically yeah. saying you're comfortable in this particular behavioral pattern, 
that's in your brain. It's you plus this environment equals doing something. I want to change that. I got to break the formula. So now mm-hmm. I need to know what do I need to insert in the new formula, which mm-hmm. is inserting a new narrative that aligns with their highest values. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's because it appeals to the future leadership community. There will be a breaking status quo thinking, essentially yeah. breaking the formula. Um, yes, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much. This awesome. Was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you.